Good morning. My name's Philip. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are in uh, continuing in a series called Family. And today we're going to talk about how to create, how to inspire a, a flourishing faith in the wicked world God says we live in. How do we help our kids have a flourishing faith in the midst of this wicked world? Now, anybody ever been around kids? Try to teach something, do something alongside with some of you are like tapping kids right now at this moment. Um, you, you didn't hear me ask because you were saying something to your kids. Um, anybody who's ever been around kids and tried to do something with them has a certain expectation, and sometimes you have to adjust the expectations along the way. This week I read a couple of tweets about expectations of parents. One guy's Twitter handle I thought was pretty clever. It's not dead, but dad and buried. Dad and buried. This is what he tweeted. Vacation fantasy, beach, sun, fun, tanning, sleeping, vacation reality with kids, car, screaming, sunburn, screaming, opening juice boxes, screaming, sand everywhere. A mom named Penn Jewell said, parenting expectation, guiding my child to adulthood with love and wisdom. Parenting reality. It's Sunday, 8 p.m., and I have to paint a pumpkin to look like George Washington by morning. <laughs> Parents have expectations for their kids, whether we think about it or not. And some of those are very good, and they come from good places. And some of them are messed up, <laughs> again, whether we notice or not. Today, we want to talk about what is God's expectation for us and our kids. Let's pray together. Lord, your word is yours. It is you revealing to us who you are and who you expect us to be and, and what sin is and how to repent. And you are the one who teaches us how these relationships are meant to work within our family. And so I can speak some words. We can read scripture. I can explain some context, but only you only you, Holy Spirit, can take words that are spoken or read and convert them by your power into words that pierce our heart, convict our minds, and move us to be closer with you and teach our kids how to do the same. And we pray it in Christ's name. And the church said, amen. Um, <clears throat> This message obviously is about kids, and I, I know a lot of you already started to check out. Check back in. Because whether you are single or dating or married without kids or married with kids at home or empty nesters, yay, or grandparents, yay, the reality is, as a church family, we have kids within our congregation that we want to see a, a flourishing faith within, right? And so some of you are influencing kids who are in their teens and 20s because you're their boss at work. And some of you have kids in your own household. And some of you are volunteering in ministries that focus on kids in the church. Don't check out, check in. This is God's word, and it has an application regardless of where you might be stage of life, all right? Has everybody checked back in? Okay, we're going to go one at a time all around the room I just, before I can continue. <laughs> Terry, you're good. Okay, so everybody's checked back in, and you're ready to hear this. I want you to think about what are your priorities for the kids you influence, for your kids? Here's my question. What do your kids think you want for them the most? Be honest. Don't give me a church answer. You don't have to say it out loud. Don't give a church answer. Be honest. What do your kids think you want for them the most? In our culture overall, there's some pretty common answers. I think one of the most common answers you might hear, you probably have said it at some point, and it's not a bad answer. It's just a shallow answer. And it is, I just want them to be happy. Okay. Toys and ice cream will do that at least for a little while, but it won't last. There's a little more to it than that. There's some people, another common answer might be, I just want them to succeed, to succeed, to live well, to have enough. Is there a clear target for that, <laughs> right? Are, are they going to be clear or confused? It might help them for a little bit, but I want you to catch this. We have to wake up to this. We live within this air of our culture so much that if we don't intentionally wake up and notice it, we will just be swept away by it. All those expectations that so many Americans have for their kids are centered on self. They're centered on what I want for them, which may or may not be healthy all the time. They're centered on what they think they want, which we know is not right all the time. 
But, but the bottom line is that as followers of Jesus, we, our greatest desire, our highest hope for our children should be that they have a life that is centered on Jesus, not on self. Amen? Yes? Agree? If you're wrestling with it, keep wrestling with it because that is, a, that is what it takes for them to have a flourishing faith within this wicked world. And it's the second time I've said that. And I know for some people, you can cringe a little. No, the world's not wicked. It's, I mean, the mountains are beautiful and I like the beach and there's some nice people that are my neighbors. And go read Romans 3 and it'll deconstruct all that for you. Nobody is spiritually good except those who are in Christ. And it's not because they got good. It's that he gave them his goodness. And so it's so crucial for us to catch that the world is not your child's friend, it is God's enemy. That's not a personal opinion of Philip, it's not a soapbox, it's scripture. If you have your Bibles, you can open to 1 John chapter 2, 1 John 2, we're going to look at 15 through 17 here. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. Now, pause. The translation of the Greek word cosmos into world here is this. The world is used hundreds of times in Scripture by God to say the system of the world that is built around self, me, myself, and I, I'm the center of the universe. That's what the world means in this context. So it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. And then it says, he takes it quite a bit further, not a step, a leap. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This is an either-or situation. It's not, I love the world, and I have a wonderful plan for my life, and I, let, I guess I'll let God come along too. No, it's either I'm Lord, lowercase l, of my life, or he's Lord, capital L, because he already is, and I'm more than glad to also have him Lord over me, and I get it now, and I'm following him. Everybody follow? Got me? And then he says why the world system is so messed up. Here's what he says. He says, for everything in the world, first he says, the cravings of sinful man. Me, I'm going to get mine. I'm, I'm going to live for me. I'm, going to, I'm number one. I'm going to look out for me. Cravings of sinful man. The lust of his eyes, coveting, greed, and the boasting of all he has and does, pride and ego, me, myself, and I, rah, rah, rah. And he says, those come not from God, but from the world. The world and its desires are going to pass away. It's temporary. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. God He loves you, but he doesn't much care so much how your life goes right now as he once cares about how your life goes, period, forever. There's a lot of times God does not want his people happy. He wants them holy, and sometimes we don't like that part, and yet that's a huge part of him disciplining us and growing us and stretching us and using us and putting us through suffering because Maybe we're doing just fine, but somebody needs to see a Christian suffer and what it means to turn to God. It is a crucial component that we understand that the world and our spiritual enemy, they're glad for your kid to be excellent at everything as long as it's not surrendering to God and following him. The world would be glad for your kid to be a star, TikTok famous, millionaires, as long as they're not following after the Lord. It's only God and people who are following, following God actively who are going to show children how to follow God actively. The world's not going to do that by its very nature. There's an old legendary story about a guy who lived in a valley. He walks up a mountain. He's getting herbs for medicine and vegetables to eat. And a, a storm, a winter storm just drops in. Blustery winds, sleet and snow, freezing. He kind of wraps his, up as best he can in his jacket, slings his bag on his shoulder and starts down the mountain. And as he's going down the mountain, he sees a venomous snake, one that's known to be deadly in their region. And he kind of skirts around it on the path. And, and as he does, the snake speaks out loud. Hey, 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 please. I'm going to die in this cold. I can't generate my own heat. Please carry me down to the warmth. And, and, and in exchange, I promise I will not strike you. The guy stands and waits for a second. He thinks about it. Gosh, I don't know, I guess. And he picks it up, puts it in his jacket, and he starts walking down the mountain. And he gets down to the warmer part, uh, and he, he gently begins to lay it down. And just as he does, bam, strikes him. Starts feeling his arms swell. He can't hardly breathe. And he knows he's going to die. And he looks at the snake, and he's like, you said you wouldn't. Why did you do that? And the snake says, I'm a snake. That's the world. The world's going to make your kid all about them. They're going to make you about you. They're glad for all that because everybody then is on equal footing and we're all messed up. God is saying, hey, follow me. I'm going to use you well beyond what you thought you were ever capable of to minister to people greatly. 
The kind of flourishing faith we want to see in our kids, we see an example of it in Daniel chapter 3. If you want to turn there, Daniel chapter 3. I got to tee up Daniel 1. We're not going to read it unless you want to take two hours, but (laughs) we're not going to. I'm going to give you the context. God's people have said to God so long, so often, so much, we don't need you. We're going to do things the way we want, that God punishes them. And the punishment's pretty severe. A neighboring nation, Babylon, wicked, hating of God, and yet used by God, conquers God's people. Now, there's some faithful ones he protects throughout, which we'll talk about in a second. But he, there is a punishment that comes when we sin and ignore God again and again, and that happens. And part of what Babylon wants is to eliminate this other nation forever. So part of what they do, the strategy is, they take some of the best and brightest out of Israel, and they cart them over to Babylon, and they put them in the royal court, and they feed them well, and they teach them the Babylonian language and governance and culture, and they want them to just be Babylonian at heart. And the people that get carried over there are Daniel and some other friends. Now, the Babylonian names they also got renamed to, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for those who've heard that story somewhere along the way. And so they're moved over here. But I want you to catch this. What I'm preaching about today from this word for us to do, their parents had done. Daniel and his friends were devoted to God. Several conflicts happen, and that brings us to chapter 3 in Daniel. And what happens is Nebuchadnezzar, so full of himself, so powerful, he's conquered so many lands at this point that he says, I am worthy of your worship. And he builds a giant golden idol, a big statue of himself. And he says, hey, compose me some music. And then he tells everybody in earshot, he's like, hey, when the music kicks in, all of you have to bow your faces to the ground and worship me, my image of me. And the music starts, and everybody bows the knee and is worshiping him, except Daniel and his friends who just stand. They don't, th- they don't hold a protest. They don't scream. They don't throw any rocks. They just stand. They just refuse. And some of the people who are supposed to have their heads down, a lot of hypocrisy on the part of people who are not Christians, look up, and they're like, oh, and they tattle. And when they tattle then, Daniel and his friends are brought before the king. And that's where we pick up in Daniel chapter 3, the middle of verse 15, He's repeating some stuff he said earlier. And then he says, if you're ready to fall down, he's speaking directly to them. If you're willing to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Don't don't think about the furnace in your house. This is a large building. It's been heated. It, It can destroy multiple people's lives. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hands? I want you to catch this. We want a strong faith in our kids that is uncompromising, that, 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 has, that, that there's no matter the cost, they will follow after God. These guys' lives are on the line and listen to their response. They said, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. This is not sass. This is them saying, when it comes to our worship, we answer only to God. That's what it means by this statement. And then, he's, and then they go on. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it and will rescue us from your hand, O king. They express an ultimate trust in God to take care of them, to protect them in this. And then they take it a step further, a faith that is not compromising. They're not not cutting any deals, and they say, but even if he does not save our lives, even if he does let us die, We want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, we're about to talk about the miracle part, and the miracle's beautiful, and God can do them at any point he wants. He owns all the molecules and can move them in any way he wishes. But I want you to catch, this is the important part of the story. They, no matter the cost, are going to follow God, trust in him, no matter what. Everybody follow? Okay, king's furious. Can't believe you would say that to me. He orders a couple of guards, go throw these three guys into the furnace. The two guys who are supposed to be throwing them in, who are taking them over there, they die from exposure to the heat. But these guys fall into the furnace and take a walk around it. And they're alive. They're unburned. They're unharmed. And the king looks in and is like, what what is happening? And eventually, I'm I'm, I'm microwaving here. Hey, come here. And they come walking out of the furnace. They don't even smell like smoke. They've been protected by God supernaturally. But what I want you to catch was it was their profession of faith that was the most important. They said, hey, even if we die, we will worship God and God alone. I want you to catch that. 
And so he's so impressed with what God has done that in verse 28, this guy who does not believe in God, doesn't even really know God, he says, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego. He's giving praise to a God he doesn't know because of the power he's seen God use to protect them. And then he says, who sent his angel and rescued his servants, they trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God other than their own God. The miracle is impressive. The faith is what he talks about more. The flourishing faith right in the middle of a wicked nation. Do you know what he does next? He promotes them. He puts them in a higher place of leadership. And so it's Babylon that hates God. But in the middle of that are these young men who say, following God no matter what. And he elevates them and says, well, if you're going to honor him, you're probably going to take care of other people and puts them in charge. And they continue to walk in that faith and practice that faith right in the midst of Babylon, in the midst of a wicked world. I want you to ask yourself this. Do you want to see that kind of resolute faith, trust in God in the hearts of our children? Do we want to see that kind of heart within them for God? Here's the thing. God is the only one who has the power to save a soul, and yet he uses us. We're the means. He's the one who accomplishes the ends, but he uses us. We're given charges with, of responsibilities to tell them about God, to show them how to follow God, to expect them to follow God, and then to teach them and correct them so that they can follow God on their own. And that's not, again, it's not a soapbox. It's, it's a passage of Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and the you know, first time that God gave them the Ten Commandments, by the time Moses is walking down with them, they're already building their own idol and worshiping something else. Deuteronomy, the title Deuteronomy means second giving of the law. He's giving them a second chance, and he says, here's my word. Here are my instructions. Here are my commands. And look at verse, ch uh, chapter 6, verse 6. These commandments, God speaking, that I give you today are to be where? I heard, <laughs> where are these supposed to be? Upon our hearts. They're not supposed to be in a book on a shelf. They're supposed to be moved from that by understanding prayer and study with others to then be on our hearts, guiding our lives. Okay? That's the first part. Then look what he says. Verse 7. Impress them on your children. The verb impress in, in the Hebrew is the same word you would use if you were playing with um, like silly putty or Play-Doh and you took a cookie cutter and pushed it in there and it made that shape. We're trying to impress God's word onto the hearts of children while they're pliable and moldable early in life so that they have that mold, that stamp of who he is in their life overall. Impress them on your children. And some of you are like, I don't know how to do that. Don't worry. God's real clear. Let's see. Let's see what extraordinary, miraculous things you and I are supposed to do to impress the word of the Lord on our children. Let's read it. You ready? Look. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. It's very ordinary means. Every single one of us is capable of doing this. And still some of us, I'm sure, are like, yeah, but I don't know enough about it to... Life group, time in the Word, school of ministry, Bible study this summer for the women. There are a lot of opportunities to gain what you need in order to have it to be able to share with them. And so I want you to, I want you to catch the simplicity that he is calling us to here. There's two responsibilities. I've given you the heart of the message, the call of the message, the responsibility of this. And I want you to hear and understand there's two responsibilities I want you to leave here with today. Okay, two of these. The first word I want you to say out loud is demonstrate. Everybody say demonstrate. demonstrate. Say it again like you actually mean it. Okay, I want this to stick with you. Demonstrate true faith personally. Some of you are like, ah, it's a gotcha moment. We were supposed to tell our kids, now you got to tell me it's got to be me. I didn't gotcha, he gotcha. He got us because this is it. He said, let them be upon your hearts before then we can turn and impress them on others. And so this is you and I taking God seriously in all of our choices. We're supposed to judge ourselves. Everybody's like, judge not, judge not, judge. you can't judge me, you don't know me. Right, God does, and he says that we're to judge ourselves. 
In the second letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he said in, verse, in chapter 13, verse 5, he said, examine yourselves to see, watch, if you're in the faith. Watch this. If you get offended, it's you and God, not you and me. Watch. He writes a letter to people who say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And he says to those people who've professed Christianity, check yourselves, examine yourselves to see whether your behavior is lining up with the words you're saying. We're called to check ourselves against his word. Test yourselves. What kinds of tests are those? Are we actually actively trusting God or trying to work our own plans? Hebrews 3 talks about that. Am I growing in holiness? Do I look more like my neighbor and the, the cool TikToker, or do I look more like Jesus, season by season, year by year? Hebrews chapter 12 and 1 John 3 speak to that. Is my attitudes, are my attitudes and my motives, are they showing the fruit of the Spirit that we see in Galatians chapter 5? Am I showing faithfulness? Am I showing trust, forgiveness? And am I on, in an ongoing way, am I repenting of my sin? First John 1 says, every time the Holy Spirit says, hey, that's a sin, that immediately I should be turning saying, God, please forgive me of that. I reject it, and I want to do what you have to say. Is that a part of my life? We're supposed to test ourselves, examine ourselves to make sure that our behavior is matching up with our profession of faith. The other thing I would tell you about this demonstrating it is that we're called to find out what God says in the Word on every topic of life, and then do it. Find out what He says and do it. And I'll tell you, in all these years of pastoring, I can tell you there's quite a few people who are like, I don't know, that sounds like legalism. Well, let me just draw a distinction between obedience and legalism. Are you ready? Legalism is when you try to force me to do what you say is right. That's legalism. Not cool, not good. You're right. We shouldn't abide by that. Obedience is when we say, hey, we're Christians. What does God say? Let's do it, even if we have to force ourselves to go do what he says. That's the difference. It's not an external somebody saying, you better do it. If it's a brother or sister in Christ just saying, dude, come on, let's get on board, that's not legalism, that's help, hope, prayer, fellowship, encouragement, accountability. But it's us walking in his ways. It's, it's not us, it, it's not your life anymore. If you said, Jesus saved my life and lead it, it's not yours anymore, it's not your mouth anymore. You don't get to just have opinions however you want. What does he say? Let's do it. That's what we then walk in. Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6, probably one, one of the more famous verses of the Old Testament and speaks directly to this. It says, trust in the Lord with what? Out loud, come on. All our hearts, every part of us, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not, do not depend on your own understanding of the world. I think this is how it should be. That could be a nice starting point. What does he say it should be on any given topic? And then it says, in all your ways, all the different aspects of your life, your bad days, good days, decision-making, choices, hurting people you want to minister to, in all those situations, in all those ways, acknowledge him. Hey, what does he say about this? What does he tell me to do for somebody who's hurting like this? I'm, I'm acknowledging him, and then he will make your path straight. And that, that Hebrew word straight means right, righteous, holy. He's going to make that life look more like his own life again and again. Demonstrate. Our first responsibility is to demonstrate true faith personally. The second responsibility, everybody say the word dedicate. Dedicate. Catch this. We're going to dedicate real efforts on our children's behalf to lead them toward true faith. We're going to dedicate real efforts. Here's what happens with far too many people. When the United States created the box called television and made entertainment our God, we lost track of this pretty badly. But what's supposed to be happening in our lives is we have real efforts. What happens with far too many families is, I love the Lord, I'll go to church, I'll take my kids there, and without saying it in a negative way, they're like, and I hope it sticks. I, I hope they get it. I want them to get it. But there's no effort. There's no peace. Do you do that with our homework? Are you like, hey, go sit over there by your algebra book and we'll hope it gets through? Nope. Are we like, hey, just sit over there near the kitchen and maybe it'll clean itself? That's not what happens. What happens? Real efforts. Step by step, little by little, that's what we do. And that's what we got to do with passing the faith along as well. Uh, this week as I was praying through these passages and taking this assigned you know, subject to bring to our church, this is a question that haunted me in a holy fashion, and I hope it can do the same for you. I want to ask you this question. Do you want to take your kids to church, or do you want to take your kids to God? 
Now, bringing kids to church is great. I'm glad you're here. Congratulations. Good first step. Great. Or same step you've been doing for years and years and fantastic. That's good because we do gather and we do pay attention to God and that's right. But I can't do that for an hour a week and expect that they're going to have a flourishing faith. It has got to be a matter instead that I say, no, I want to take them to God. I want to take them to God. I'm going to show them how and walk with them again and again. If you've ever had toddlers and you had to take them somewhere like the fair, right, or the mall. Remember when we used to have malls? And anyway, when you went in a public place with a lot of people and you have toddlers, is this how you do it? This is this how you do it? I have two toddlers and I'm like, all right, you guys stay nearby me. Does that work? Now, if they're a firstborn child, they might be like, yes, ma'am, and go right with you, right? But all the middle children and the babies are like, nope, <laughs> gone to whatever smells good. Or I think I can eat off the floor, right? That's not what we do. What do you do with toddlers when you're, we want to keep them safe and keep them with you? What happens? I have hold of them. They're with me. I'm walking and they're walking and we're doing this together. This is what should be happening to pass faith on to them, dedicating real efforts that, keep, that guide them toward true faith. I want you to say, that how, many people, how many people are sick of saying words out loud? Feel free to raise your hand. I want to just see who's sarcastic enough to go ahead and do it. Thank you. Very good. Appreciate that. Now, I, say, I'll, I only get, ask you to say two words so far. The first was demonstrate true faith personally. The second was dedicate real efforts. But then now, I want to tell you how to do that. And there's three words. Say them with me. Daily, weekly, always. Daily, weekly, always. These are the, the how or the when that we do this. First, daily, in your home, in your lifestyle, should be a time of word and prayer. Daily, there should be a time of word and prayer in your lifestyle, in your home. Deuteronomy 6, where was that? While we're sitting at home, while we're going down the road, while we're putting them down for bed, while we're getting up in the morning. The routines of our life should include at least a moment every day where the Bible is open and we are taking time to read that together. Some of you are like, I have two kids. I don't think I can get them sit still in one spot. We have seven and we made it happen. Were they all in the right spot at the right time? No. Did some fall asleep during devotions? Yes. Is it messy? Yes. Everything with children is. So devotional time is not going to have an instant blessing of God that everybody's like, yes, Father, I shall sit now and hear the words that thou shalt dispense. Nope, not going to happen. You're going to be teaching your kids. You're going to be reading a family devotional. You're going to be like, oh, look at this. This is so cool. Jesus was fully God and fully man. And your five-year-old's gonna go, oh, did Jesus fart? <laughs> and you're gonna be like, I'm gonna ask Pastor Philip and let him ask you, answer that for you. But you're gonna say, yeah, he was real. So he probably burped and farted. And your five-year-old's gonna be like, oh. But then what you're gonna say is what that means is he knows what it's like to live our life and he is perfect and we can follow him forever. One time, we, we did a devotional with our kids from the time they were infants up through high school, and it gets harder when they get spread out and all that jazz with schedules, but we did it regularly, and sometimes it's just a few minutes, sometimes it was 15 or 20. When they got older, we'd be like, hey, what are you reading in your teen devotional Bible? And they'd open it and read something. When they had to come up with something out of the blue, they could share what they were learning, and that was good. And so we'd go back and forth. And one time, one of our kids who remained nameless said, uh, said out loud while we were having a devotional time, I was like, hey, you remember that time when I was born in a manger in Bethlehem? No, that wasn't me, that was Jesus. And, and our whole family got to laugh, but watch, it's accurate. It's accurate, it's right. It's, it's a proper statement of that. I want you to catch, it's going to be messy and it's going to be worth it over and over Again, you daily are going to take time. Here's the thing. When they can't read, you read the Bible to them. When they begin to read, you read the Bible with them. And for their whole life, they should see you reading the Bible alongside them over and over again. Daily. What was the second one? Weekly. Weekly, we go to church together. We go to church together. Are there sometimes screaming children and parents with gnashing of their teeth? Yes. Yep, I'm a pastor. I've had a lot of fights on the way to church. Lots of times, sure. And then we got there and said, God, take us as we are and take us to the next step. I've preached while depressed. 
Our, our family, has, uh, some of our kids have helped lead worship right after they had a fight in the car. That doesn't mean it's n- not real there. It means it's very real all the places where we go, but we go to church together. And I bet a lot of parents think, hey, when our kids go to kids' church, sometimes walking across the parking lot or after we order our food at the restaurant, we're like, hey, what did you learn in kids' church today? And you ask your kids and they go, I don't know, right? That's, that's the typically the first answer, right? And then you're like, okay, what was it about? Anything at all? Uh, donkey? Okay, which donkey? Like what happened with the donkey? Uh, I don't know, swords or something. Okay, good. And what did you learn about it? Um, do what God says. Right, good. We still got to a point, right? We're used to that, but I will, t- I will, I will dare you to do this. A- have, teach your children to ask you what you got out of big church. So when they ask you, you're like, oh, what did you get out of church, mom? Mom looks over and says, you know, there's a part in the message today I realize I am not doing a good job of X, and I prayed and asked God to help me with that. Vulnerability, honesty, humility, showing them that there's an ongoing process to grow. Daily, weekly, and always. Are you ready? Here's the always. Always, we talk about God naturally as part of our habits and our decisions and our hopes and our worst days. All the time, when we're sitting at home, we're going down the road, when we're putting them to bed, when we're waking up. I'd give you two tests to use here. Two tests. The first is, what do your kids hear you talk about the most? They're listening whether, you're paying, whether you think so or not. How many people have heard your kids quote something back to you ever? How many of you were excited? How many of you immediately took them to the bathroom and said, please don't ever say that again? What do your kids hear you say the most? What do they hear you say the most passionately? Let it be about God. Let that be what's most. Let that be what's most passionate. Here's a second test you can give. When your kids look at your schedule, what do they see? What do they see you spending time on? What do your kids see you doing the most? What do your kids see you doing the most passionately? Can you make that God? Can that become, can it rise up step by step to be the most important thing? I'm just gonna tell you, look, this, this message is a heavy responsibility. Some of you are hearing it and going, whew, yep. I can't lighten that load. I didn't give you that load. God gave us that load and his presence and his help and his instructions to get it done right. And the challenge today to take next steps in it. There's always hope. Some of you have kids and they're so far from the Lord and you are concerned for them, but there's always hope because there is God and he has the power and the presence and the love to make changes in people's lives. He changes lives and he changes hearts. And he does it with very ordinary means. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a crazy dichotomy here. He saved my wife as her parents diligently dedicated regular efforts to leading her to true faith in Christ. It worked and stuck. It's fantastic. But watch this hope. God saved me despite having zero of those efforts during my upbringing years. People in college began to tell me about Jesus. Others who were not my parents but did care about my soul began to tell me about him. You have the chance to influence people that are not your children and people who are your children, whatever form that might be. And I will just tell you, vulnerably, I can say that for Teresa and I, among our seven kids, they they are not all walking with the Lord. They are not all walking in His ways, doing what we know God desires for them. And that's painful at times. It hurts our hearts. We want that for them so much. It can, it can be confusing because they all had the chance to, to sit at God's feet, to be in healthy churches, to be cared for and given grace and to hear his word. And we know that, but I want you, I'm gonna give you a secret. I'm gonna finish with a secret. Are you ready? Here's the secret of how we respond to our kids who are walking with the Lord and how we respond to our kids who are not walking with the Lord. So jot it down if you want. Here's the secret. We demonstrate true faith personally to them in both categories. And we dedicate real efforts on their behalf to draw them toward true faith as well. Teresa and I pray for all of our kids, their spouses and interested parties around them and our grandkids every day. And that's not a That's not a Hail Mary. That is a constant, diligent intercession on their behalf. It's a spiritual work that takes place when we pray. And then we also, 
walk the talk, we keep the faith, we ask them questions, we initiate conversations. We had a fantastic conversation just last night, encouraging some really great Christ-centered decisions happening in one of our kids' lives. And, and then with our kids who are not walking with the Lord, we don't, we don't preach at them, but we are, we are never shy <laughs> to say, hey, God loves you more than I do. And I'm constantly praying for you and I would love to see you walking with him again. That's what we say, we, we don't shy away from it. One of our kids years ago made a confession to us sitting on the couch across from us and it was a very heavy, sinful, difficult thing that they had chosen. And they looked at us and they said, after finishing that confession, they said to us, I don't plan to change and I don't expect you to change either. And it was a statement of saying, I know what you believe, and it's always been true, and it still is. And I want you to understand there was conflict there, but there was still the foundation of respect for the fact that that faith was real in us, and we desired it for them. These are not pretty conversations most of the time. They're messy, hard, fantastic conversations that give us a chance to see them walk with flourishing faith. I've, I, I, I've never been a great evangelist. I'm a really good teacher. I don't have a smooth transition. Kaboom, we're at the end of the message. And I have two calls for you, you ready? First, if you're sitting here in this message, live in the room or online or you listen to it later and you're thinking, hey, good message, I like all that about the kids and all that stuff, but I need Jesus. If your thought is that, yeah, I'd be glad to pass him on to others, but I don't know him. What happens next? How does that work? My heart is heavy, I need forgiveness. I will tell you, this is the message Jesus preached. First and always, repent and believe. If you're not a follower of Jesus, it's repent and believe. I'm not gonna lead you in a prayer. I'm just gonna tell you this is how it works. God says it's a sin. I reject it and I turn to him and I say, I trust, I believe that you and you alone can save me and lead my life. That's it. No magic words, that's it. And that can happen in a sanctuary. For me, it happened in a dorm room. For other people, it's happened in a coffee shop. But that's it. We repent and believe. And so if you don't know Christ, that's it. That's your start. And if you're like, well, what happens next? Take a connect card and just write in there. Philip told me to ask, what's next? And just put some contact info and we'll get you a Bible that you might, if you need one, we'll meet with you. We have life groups. We have places for you to connect, for you to learn how to take the next step. Second call, are you ready? It's for every single human being in the room. You've heard a message. And you should go do something with it. I'm all out of notes. I'm not gonna tell you what to go do with it. God already told you what to go do with it. When the word is preached, God's spirit works. And a lot of my words, the majority of my words have fallen on the floor nearby you and nobody's offended, me nor you. But there were moments in the message in which God's spirit said, hey, pay attention to that. There are moments in the message when you're like, boom, struck in the heart by it. That's not a good preacher. That's the presence of God at work. So don't ignore it. But I wanna give you some grace because some of you may be sitting here thinking, man, I feel so guilty because I haven't done this. Here's what I want you to do. God never gives you guilt. He gives you responsibility. So you take the guilt part, separate it out, put it on the shelf and say, God, what do you want me to do now? What's the next step? I, can't, I don't have a time machine to fix backwards, but what do I do going forwards?